What's going on? I muted you. Oh, you oh, muted me? Sorry. I'm mute. So welcome everyone to the member Natural Capital Coalition member consultation webinar. Um, we've set these up for those of you who weren't able to attend and join us up in Scotland last week for the World Forum on Natural Capital. I know that a lot of you will be in Paris this week as well and traveling, so thank you for your agenda to come and join us. There will be plenty of opportunity for us to discuss uh, what we're going to be talking about, but if I could ask you to all mute yourselves um, at the beginning of the conference, as we do have a lot of people on the call up at different times for So I, I will be recording this as well, and hopefully we'll be able to share this with uh, people that weren't able to join us today. So thank you very much for joining. Um, we've had a really exciting couple of weeks, and I'm very proud to be able to um, say that we now have a draft version of the Natural Capital Protocol and accompanying sector guides for apparel and food and beverage. It's um, been a long road to get here, but we now have something that a lot of the people involved in putting this together are very proud of, and it's great taking this out to share with um, all of the members uh, and the broader community um, to get your input into at this point and make sure that we improve it in July uh, next year in 2016. Um, just to give you a little bit of an outline of who's on the call today, there's myself, Mark Goff, I'm the Executive Director of the Natural Capital Coalition. Um, we also have uh, Stephanie Heim, who's the tech who's on to comment from KPMG. Hello, everyone. Um, we also have Ali Jones, who's the Relationship Manager, on to comment from Arcadis. Hi, everybody. Um, and also, not, no, not yet with a picture up here, but uh, Henrik Dinnison, who's just joined us as his Executive Assistant, has uh, just joined in the last week. So, Henrik, do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. So uh, that's the team at the moment who are on the call. Um, obviously, the coalition is a collaboration, and there are lots of people involved in this process. So um, uh, here are some of the members. Um, we're now at 170 members in the coalition. Um, that's increased from uh, 78, I think, back in March this year. So a increase in the number of organizations uh, that are seeing that this is going to be key to their future. Um, and are looking for projects and ways to engage capital. I'm getting quite a lot of beeping here. I hope uh, it's not distracting everyone too much. Um, the coalition, as I said, is made up of a lot of organizations. <laughs> um, it's, we have lots of organizations. I'm just going to mute everyone uh, manually from here, and then that will, I think, stop the... There we go. Um, I'll open that back up again in a moment. So, um, as I was saying, we have uh, within the coalition lots of different spoken about. It's obviously not helping very much, but uh, please excuse me. The, um, we have seven different worlds within the coalition. First of all, we have the NGO community and uh, the uh, civil society and those um, people. Uh, if you are um, continuing to mute and unmute, don't worry about it. The whole line on mute now, so you don't need to continually mute and unmute. I think this may be people joining the call, actually. So, um, as I was saying, we have uh, seven different worlds within the coalition. The first of those is NGO society. We then also have after that, and they create the need. We then have after that um, the researchers and data, um, scientific and academic, who provide the information and data and, and uh, resources for organizations to make better. We then have businesses, which we see as being part of the solution to, the, uh, to any issues around natural capital. Um, after businesses, we have associations, and you'll see lots of associations in here that bring together those organizations, share best practice, but then also develop the tools to help to take it into um, um, to scale. After that, we have the standard setters and reporters that start setting the that people may use, um, which leads us on to the finance community organizations to be able to uh, um, actually make change. And then finally on to policy makers and governments um, within this uh, group who are there to make sure, obviously, that we have the enabling environment to take this forward. So how does uh, the protocol, which we've uh, now launched, fit into the um, coalition strategy? 
Well, as you can see, this is one part of four streams that we're working on. The first of those is data, and that's about trying to understand what the questions are within those seven stakeholder groups and make sure that they're linked up around data. It's going to be a new database or new system. It's very much based around the framework and understanding the rules of engagement around data and data use. We also have the pro protocol and sector guides, which I'll talk about more about today and how you can get involved. And then we have the enabling environment. Um, with that, we've started, we've had two workshops in the last couple of months, which has produced a white paper. Um, and those two workshops have been based in um, the UK and the Netherlands, and we're looking to take this out further now as well. The paper that's been produced um, is called Enabling Business Decisions that Integrate Natural Capital. And what we're particularly looking at there is the different levers that help to uh, move this agenda forward. It can't, it, it's not always going to be uh, regulation or top-down. It will not always be market drivers, although both of those are important. So reporting requirements may be an important lever in here. But there are other things as well, and we're particularly looking at complexity theory to unlock that. Um, and I think this will be a really interesting aspect of the work about how do we make sure that the protocol is launched into an environment that is supportive of it. The final one is outreach and advocacy, and particularly there we're looking at the the engagement, not just within our circle of all those people on the call today, but those that are outside of that as well. So the Natural Capital Protocol. Um, as you'll know, this is a unique collaborative process, including many of the members and organizations involved. A lot of these names that you'll see here um, through the WBCSD-led consortium and the IUCN-led consortium are, are people that have been doing this space for some time, including some of the companies that have been leading in this era. So what we've been doing is bringing them together, and they've been the people that have been producing uh, the protocol that is now available online and the sector guides. Um, and it's the, the difference here is that they do come from a wide range of organizations, and the collaborative nature of this means that we can really produce something that has the breadth and depth that it needs to be able to make a difference here. So we have now three draft documents, um, which is great to be able to see. Um, I think this slide's a little bit uh, confused actually here, but um, um, the draft documents are available online. Um, that you can access those through the Collaborators website. And we're telling you a little bit more about how you can do that in, the, in a little while. So the consultation, um, all members, hopefully all of you on the line today have received your logon details to Collaborators. Um, for other people that are not the key contact in the membership, um, if they contact us and want to get involved, they'll be given your name and details and told that you already have access. What we're trying to do is stream through one person um, so that we can help to uh, aggregate and bring that information through in a very um, practical and robust way. We also have set up an expert review panel. The expert review panel is individuals from around the world who've been doing a lot around integrated thinking, around including uh, natural capital into decision making, and we've picked different sectors um, that I was talking about, those stakeholder groups at the beginning. Um, and they will be also looking at this and, and uh, giving their thoughts and contributions to the consultation process. We also are open to other contributions, so it's an open process. Anyone can apply to us and, and get access to it. Um, they go onto the website, give us their details, and then we give them access to the collaborative system. And finally, we're running workshops and webinars, um, today being one of them. Several of our members are also running webinars as well. Uh, if you're a member of one of our member organizations, you may have been invited to some of their workshops. And we started this off in Edinburgh with a face-to-face -face meeting um, last week as well. This is all being supported, the consultation process, by pilot testing. Um, we have over 50 companies in the pilot testing process. Um, this is being managed by CISL. And the thing to remember here is that this is a draft document, and we will be launching the version one of the protocol in uh, July, July the 12th, 2016. As well as that being launched in London on that date, we'll also be looking for launches at other um, venues around the world, including the World Congress uh, in Hawaii with the IUCN and other events um, that will be going on, including uh, one in November in, uh, in the Netherlands and, and others around the world to launch this in those different stakeholder groups. So getting into a bit more detail now, the Natural Capital Protocol, you've seen this sentence several times, we've been using it for a long time, but I just wanted to start breaking it down so you can see the framing of what we're doing here with the Natural Capital Protocol. So the first thing is our definition of natural capital. 
As you will see here, we are including both renewable and non-renewable natural resources here. So that includes not just plants, animals, air and water, but also the minerals, um, oil and gas, etc. All of those things that come into it as well. The reason for doing this is that what we're looking at is influencing and by influencing decisions, you need to have an integrated approach to this. And therefore, for us, it's very important that we have renewable and non-renewable resources within the definition. This is all up for debate, and this is something we want to have your points on, points of view on through the consultation process. The next thing I wanted to highlight was this standardized framework. You'll remember that what we're trying to do here is something that will be applicable to all businesses, all business sectors, and all scopes. The way that we're doing this is leveraging existing approaches. And you'll remember that when we first started on this journey uh, about uh, nine months ago now, nine, ten months ago, the first we had a methodological review panel that went out and started to look at those systems and processes that were already out there as a basis for what we can do. What we're doing here is not coming up with a new methodology. What we're doing is we're standardizing those methodologies through a framework. And you can see by the people involved, a lot of those people that have come up with those different approaches are involved in this harmonization process. And that's the unique thing that we're delivering here. It's not a new approach, it's a harmonization of that that will bring all of the thinking that you've been doing over these years into one place in a standardized process. The next thing is about who is this for? So just to be very clear, if you've already had access, and I hope you have, have been able to get in and see the protocol and the sector guides, it's a pretty in-depth document. It gives you a big, a wide, range of um, information around natural This isn't going to be relevant to necessarily senior leaders who may want something uh, shorter and more pithy. This is something for those users that are going to be uh, more engaged in the day-to-day -day process. We are producing other documents for other people. Um, we will have a senior leader guide um, when we launch this in July next year. We already have an overview document on our website and a framework document as well that you can access. The next thing is about measuring and value, and we've defined what we mean by this, and I think it's really important that we do this, because um, value is one of those terms that's thrown about an awful lot, um, and we need to be really clear what we do. And this, for us, is very much about the qualitative or narrative uh, amount, as well as being quantitative and monetized as well. Um, many of the organizations that are piloting this at the moment are obviously looking at the monetary um, values that can be derived from this, but you've got to be connected to the decision you're trying to influence. And if that decision only needs a qualitative uh, requirement, be what you're looking for from the protocol. Another thing here again, just taking this one phrase here, is the impacts and dependencies. Now, many companies have a, 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 a reasonably good understanding of some of the impacts that they may have. But bringing in dependencies here is something very much uh, important to the process that we're trying to deliver here. And those dependencies, the reliances that companies have on their use of natural capital is something that hopefully the protocol and the sector guides will help to um, raise as an issue within the boardroom. So to summarize this, the draft protocol can help users to identify how natural capital is relevant in, in the context for their business. It can also add useful insights and guidance, as well as helping to select the appropriate uh, measurement and valuation methods. And just to reiterate again, it's not only about those impacts, as many um, companies have already been trying to address, but also about those dependencies as well. The framework, which we introduced you to about, uh, uh, about in May time, I think it was, we, or July, June time, we launched this. Um, it, we've changed it a little bit. Um, we've still got the four stages and the 10 steps, but we've updated some of the questions on some of the feedback we've already had from you. From you. Um, we've um, broadened it a little bit as well. But this is still, as you can see from the bottom of the page here, a work in progress. And we're definitely looking for more comment on how this works as a framework. Does it cover everything you need? Um, and how does that work? The principles have also been updated slightly. As you can see here, the principles are based upon other people's work as well. We're very much trying to leverage the existing um, work that's out there and not uh, reinventing the wheel. There's uh, plenty of reinventing in our circles already going on. So what we're trying to do is harmonize here and just to reiterate that. So these are all principles that you'll be aware of and have seen before, whether it's um, relevance, which has been adapted from CDSB and GHG protocol in the way that we're using it here for natural capital, or whether it's um, something like consistency, which is uh, very much uh, coming from the adapt adaptation from IRRC and the GHG protocol again there. So 
Um, these are core to how you would go through the process and something some of those decisions as we're going through. I'm now going to hand over to Stephanie Heim, who I think you all know. Um, she's going to run us through a little bit more of the detail about the different stages and some of the decisions that we've made that we particularly are interested in your comments on as we go through the consultation process. So, Stephanie, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you very much for that, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on this webinar. What I want to do over the course of the next nine or is it ten slides is to pull out a couple of um, pieces of detail under each of the different protocol stages uh, and just really provide a little bit more introduction to them to you. So we're going to start off with the frame stage. Um, and really, the first figure shown is figure 1.1, which is on page 14 for anyone who happens to have the protocol in front of them. This figure really is trying to show how we're linking up natural capital with the flow of services, really, and the value that that creates to business and to society. So it's just a, a way for us to start to link some, some of the terminology together. If we go on to the next slide, you'll see that there's also a conceptual framework. Again, what this is trying to do is really frame some of the concepts that we're introducing, especially in the, uh, the first step, getting started, and just showing really the interlinkages between impacts and dependencies on natural capital, both for businesses and society, and the associated linkages between the costs and benefits associated with those. So that's what we're doing in that initial step. If we move on to the next slide, then um, we've, we move on to the scoping. And really, it's this table that lays out what the protocol should be able to help you with if you're looking to, to perform an assessment. So the main point, which I think has been iterated a number of times, but I'm going to say it again, is that this is a framework for decision making. You can see by the different apps listed in there, the types of decision making that a company would be taking when, when they might need to consider natural capital. That's on pages 28 and 29 of the main document. And one of the things that... Um, we have done is ask specific feedback in relation to these applications really and trying to gauge whether we've identified too many or whether actually these are accurate these are what the protocol will be most useful for, for. so moving on still within scope breaking breaking an assessment down so what we've tried to do, again, within the scoping is to really look at how you might want to set the boundaries of a particular assessment. So you're starting off with your business application and then we're moving to what bits of the organization you want to focus on. So there's an overarching option for corporate, which is the whole company, all the subsidiaries, at everything to do with the company that you're looking at. Project level, which is a, a, much, a much more detailed or granular level look, maybe at a specific site or a particular uh, issue in a particular location. And then pro product, which would be some or all of the value chain associated with a particular product that you or your company are trying to produce. And alongside that, there's the value chain consideration. So if you want to look at a product, do you want to look at it in its entirety, including downstream, your operations and upstream? Or do you actually want to focus on um, specific groups of, of people? So your upstream or downstream part of the value chain. And those value chain um, pieces are aligned with the greenhouse gas protocol scope one, two, and three. And that, again, is referenced in the document uh, on page 17. So 
the end of the scoping section, um, really the point on step four is this idea of prioritisation. But in order to prioritise, it's how you determine what impact drivers and dependencies your company has and, and then prioritise them. So what we've done in step four is talk about impact and dependency pathways. And what we're talking about here is that as a business, there will be certain things that you do and certain things that you measure in the course of your day-to-day uh, -day operations. So an example of that could be air emissions. We call that an impact driver. The air emission itself isn't the change in natural capital we're looking for, but the impact is maybe uh, reduced air quality or, or some sort of issue associated with air pollution. That's the change in natural capital that we'll be looking at. So step four sets out these different pathways. So one for impacts and one for dependencies and how these relate to business activities and what's already measured. It also helps set out how you might go about prioritising those issues, but does really rely on any materiality analyses that, that you have already had access to or have already conducted. So it gives you a bit of a flavour of the sorts of things we're talking about. So moving on, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on measure and value here. So as part of the scoping stage, you'll be looking to understand whose value you want to look at or include within your assessment. And we've broken this down into um, business impacts and the costs and benefits to a business of its own impacts and business dependencies, so the costs and benefits to the business of its dependencies, and finally, societal impacts of either impacts and dependencies. And depending on which of those you would like to value, either qualitatively, quantitatively, or in a monetary way, we've set out a pathway through the measure and value sections of the protocol to attempt to address what you would need to do in each instance. So on this follow-up slide, you can see that the first point, the first step in measure and value is really to check whether you've got the right route, whether or not you want to do all three, and then consider how you're going to navigate through the next steps. And the next steps, six, seven, and eight, are really about trying to quantify or estimate the change that you make as a company in the context of the assessment you're undertaking then how you measure the trends of natural capital that are going on in the background, and it is dependent on the application and the context of your assessment as to how you would do that. And finally, there's a step to then go to, uh, go to value those impacts and dependencies. Okay, so the last two slides before we pause for questions. The apply step. Now, the apply step um, really is broken down into um, two pieces. So first of all, in step nine, it's really about testing key assumptions and looking at who is impacted by what your company is doing, wherever in the value chain and in the context of the assessment you're undertaking. So we've put some examples of the types of considerations and the types of things you might want to test uh, as part of that process. Following on from that, we've also talked about whether or not verification and validation of the work that you've done uh, are appropriate. It's, it's really a decision for a company that's applying an assessment to make, but we've put some information in there in the protocol to help you through that process. We've also thought about whether impacts and dependencies, if, um, if what's actually felt as a result of that, of your company's behavior, shall we say, um, then 
what's the risk of internalization? How might your company be affected by that in the future? So there is some information about that too. And then finally, there are some suggestions around how you might scale up future assessments, how you might learn from, a, uh, from an initial assessment, and how you might go about embedding some process change following on from your results. So that's it from me, and I think we're now going to... So I've just unmuted you here. So um, just to be very clear about this, that today is very much about an introduction to the consultation process. We have other um, webinars which will be running in both January and February, but we'll start going into a bit more detail about these elements while the consultation is still open. But I just wanted to give an opportunity, you've had an awful lot of us talking to you for the last 25 minutes, um, to give an opportunity for some people to comment or give us some thoughts initially on, on how things are going. So if anyone wants to, um, to talk, then please, uh, now is your opportunity to, to say something. We will have another couple of pauses coming up as well. So maybe, um, I know, um, Rosie Mary, you're on the line as well. I'm hoping you're in a, a space where you can unmute yourself and, and talk. But I wonder whether you just wanted to uh, add anything. Um, obviously, Rosie Mary has been part of the core team um, producing uh, this document. I'm being a bit unfair to her because I've just seen her name on the attendee list to invite her to, um, to take part in this. But um, Rosie Mary, did you want to add anything at this stage? Thank you, Mark. Um, just to say that it's um, by looking at it all together, I just recall the, the numerous discussions we had to come up with this. So it, it's the subject of numerous iterations and numerous discussions and agreements and consensus. So we certainly hope to get feedback um, on on this approach, and we we you know are very concerned that this is clearly uh, spelled in in the in the concentration draft, but are very much happy to get your feedback on. Thank you, Rosemary. And um, we're very fortunate as well that um, Radley Yeldar, one of our members, a, a design company, have given us some support in developing this and laying it out in what I think is a, a very uh, clear and accessible document. So we haven't sent you out for consultation a Word document that we put together. It is laid out, but I do want to make it very clear. It has draft on every page. We're here for consultation. We want your input. We know there's things that still need to evolve, and it's really important through our, our theory of collaboration that we have your input to make this business useful, to make this accessible to people as we go through the process. Um, so a question has just appeared here. Um, so uh, which pre-existing methodologies have been assembled and harmonized in the protocol? On our website, you'll see that there's an awful lot of open um, source information that's been available. We also went out to some proprietary methodologies as well. And we had a methodological review panel that uh, uh, did this work at the beginning. Um, that information is all available on our website about the different types. Since then also, though, um, we continue to we're very much open to other approaches that are, are, are being used. Um, you'll be very aware of things such as Keering's EPNL, uh, which is uh, now um, uh, very much open to everyone to be able to see how they did that. And that was one of the, the many methods that have uh, contributed to this um, process. But we still have many different things that are influencing um, the writers and the authors as we're pulling this together at the moment. If there's no other questions, Hi, moment, we'll be... Uh, yep, yeah, someone just jumping in there? This is, yeah, this is Ana Maria from Conservation International as well, and I had a, a comment, well, a question. It seems like you are uh, separating food industry from other type of businesses, and I was wondering if you're going to have that same approach for other type of business, businesses or only for food and beverage? And what was so the just, reason for it? So thank you for that, and, and that's um, a good introduction to the next section we're going to be looking at here. So the, um, I'll just bring this up, this next slide as well. So the natural capital protocol is relevant to all businesses across all sectors in all geographies. Okay? So if you are any business, the natural capital protocol is what you would go to. We are very aware, though, that if you're having a very broad sweep like that, being relevant to everyone in the framework that we've put together, that you will also need to understand the nuances and relevance within your particular sector. 
We were very fortunate to get some funding to start on two sector guides in 2015-16. And the first two that we've worked on um, with funding from Gordon and Betty Moore um, and um, the IFC um, has been the apparel sector guide and the sector guide. These are not separate protocols, just to be really clear on this. These hang down from the protocol. The protocol, you couldn't use these without the protocol. So they map um, the protocol, so the whole structure of that, um, and we will be doing future ones as well. The finance sector guide, we already have um, funding for, and we will be moving forward with that in um, collaboration with the Natural Capital Declaration um, through an MOU. We're talking to other sectors as well about how they might see the use of the protocol, and one of those being the construction industry. So we expect to end up with several different sector guides, all of them hanging off the protocol, but none of them would function without having use of the protocol, just to make that very, very clear. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, thank you. So to do this, in the same way that we have done with the protocol, bringing a group of organizations together, we've done the same with both food and beverage and a they can work in the same function. So as you can see here, this is being led for us on, on our behalf by TrueCost, part of the IUCN consortium. And within that, we've got lots of different organizations that are helping to facilitate the conversation. Um, uh, we were talking to Steve Bullock the other day, who's, who's running this for us, and we are still open. So if you know organizations that want to get involved in the food and beverage discussions or the apparel discussions, um, then get in touch with us and we'll make sure that they're involved in those dis um, that, that debate. But like I said, these are things that hang off the protocol, and therefore it will always be a couple of weeks later um, that we'll be able to produce these because they need to make sense of what the protocol already contains. The pilot testing for these will also map the pilot testing we've got for the protocol, so there's no separate section there. Um, and um, just moving on here, um, I'm just going to hand over to Steph again here to talk a little bit more about how the relationship works between the protocol and the sector guides. Thanks for that, Mark. So just as Mark was describing, um, the protocol has its four stages and ten steps with um, actions underneath each. Um, what we have done in the sector guides is to provide a mapping under each step as to where the sector um, extends the protocol, provides more detail because it's needed for a particular action on that sector. So they're very much a supplement protocol with more details for a particular sector. I will be pulling out just a couple of relevant points on both of the sector, sector guides. Um, but the first thing that I would say is that each of the sector guides has two additional hypothetical examples for the sector. So in the protocol, there's one example that runs throughout, but in each of the sector guides, there are two additional hypothetical examples that are relevant for those particular sectors. So one of the areas that we've provided a little bit more detail in is the breakdown of the value chain. So this shows the example for the food and beverage sector, and if we go to the the next slide, you can see we've done the same for the apparel sector. Um, and that then leads quite nicely on to, um, to the materiality matrices that we've put in place. So what, what is really interesting about the sector, guys, especially from the, the perspective of materiality, um, a group of different products or specific commodities um, have been taken and some of the impact drivers already identified and the dependencies identified um, to give people who are working in that sector a little bit more detail about some specifics. So those are really quite nice supplementary um, pieces that provide a bit more detail, whereas the protocol itself provides more of a general um, overview of the different uh, impact and dependency um, pathways that we have. So we're just going to pause that we've um, outlined how the sector guides connect with the protocol. 
Um, I know we've just had a question about that already, but if there's any more points of clarification or anything that one, anyone wanted to raise on that, um, now's an opportunity to do that. That's great. So um, we'll now talk a little bit about how the piloting is going to connect into this process. So you'll be aware that we started the piloting process um, about a month ago now, just over that actually, um, beginning of middle of October. Um, with the piloting, you remember we launched that with 40 organizations. We now have over 50 because some of the conversations that we have um, come to completion and, and organizations have signed up to take part. Just to be very clear though, the piloting is closed. Uh, we're not accepting any more piloting companies. We're already partway through the process. We've received from those piloting companies. Um, but what we are doing is we're talking to other organizations who are going to be picking up the baton when we get to the launch next July. And we have a, a, a growing number of companies that want to start piloting and start working with the protocol. And we'll be coming back to them um, with the process of how they can go about that in due course. So you'll remember that we have above the line here, we've got 10 organizations that are looking to actually go through the whole protocol through all 10 steps to take us through um, each of those and to give their insights into that. So then we also have underneath the line a lot of other companies, and these aren't all of them by any means, that are, are looking to um, take certain aspects of it. So some of them are looking at scoping, um, particularly if they're new to this. Some of them are looking at measurement and valuation and, and different ways of uh, uh, accounting for or measuring the, the impacts that they have compared to other approaches that they've done in the past. And then there's also a, a wide number of that are actually looking at how they can then embed this in their processes and get this into decision making on, on a regular basis. So they may have already done some work here, but they want to take this to the next level. Um, there's two, two forms of feedback we're looking for here, not just um, helping us to make sure that the protocol is business useful and applicable to companies and making improvements, but also we are looking for endorsements, and I think that's really important that all of these companies at the end of this can stand up and say, this is a, this is a good approach, we, we approve this and we want to continue using it, and obviously wanting to get this to scale with many more companies using the protocol. Um, as I said, we've already had the first round of feedback, uh, which um, came through on the 20th of November. Um, we've launched the um, actual uh, consultation process at the World Forum last week, um, and we now have the second round of feedback in January, and then the third round um, coincides, as you will see here, with the consultation process on the 26th of February. Um, those first comments that I've had back um, so far have been um, very uh, positive about um, the approach. They've been looking specifically at the first two stages around framing it and around scoping, um, and that's all been extremely positive with some really clear comments about how we can start moving forward. We won't be breaking those down quite yet. We're going to spend some time considering those, seeing how that fits in with the consultation process. But we will plan to produce a report at the end of all of this, harmonizing and, and giving you a view about what those the trends that came through. Also, just to be very clear on the consultation process, all comments are transparent and are applicable to different organizations and people that have made them, and all of that will be open to people to be able to see. So it's a very open, transparent process here. We're just going to pause there for a moment, and we're very fortunate to have um, Jared Boss on the line as well here, who um, is leading the IUCN consortium that's um, running the business engagement um, and the sector guide and uh, piloting process. So Jared, I didn't know whether and throwing the ball out to you without you necessarily knowing, but whether you um, want to just add anything there that I've missed or just uh, introduce anything. Jared, if you're talking, we can't hear you. I can hear you very, very, very quietly in the background, so I don't think that's going to work. Um, I think we'll have to um, pause on that one. I see we have... Um, Another uh, question here, so um, from Joanna here. So if we're working with a company and discussing the engagement around the protocol, how can we do so in a coordinated way with you, even if they aren't official pilots? So what we're doing here is all content, all comments are going to come back through the Collaborate system. We will um, have, um, going up on the Collaborate system at the beginning of next week, uh, process uh, um, documents 
um, including a consultation pack, which will include some of the slides here, templates that you can complete, and, and other documents that will help to support that engagement with companies. So, for example, if you have been using a different, uh, a particular methodology or approach, we will have a template to how you can map that to the protocol. And that will be one of the things that you'll be able to download and use in, in engagement with the companies that you're talking to. Um, the other thing is, obviously, is, is to try and bring that together. So many of our members, including um, WBCSD, started its program of webinars and over the last couple of days. Um, BSR, RUCN, and others are all running webinars like this with their members to find ways to collaborate and bring in those, uh, those comments into one structured way to be able to feed through into the process. What we really would like to do is to find a way for um, you, Joanna, to be able to um, to do that with the companies you're working with and to be the point person. By all means, pick up the phone, give us a call, um, send us an email. If you've got specific questions and there's things coming up, we'll, we'll see how we can do that. Not everything is going to fit into one box. We're very aware of that. But what we do want to do is try to keep everything going through the collaborative system. So thank you very much for that. Um, any other questions or thoughts? No? Okay, we'll, we'll just uh, move on to the next part, which is going to be about how you can take part, which is building upon Joanna's question there. So for us, this really is a, a puzzle, and excuse the uh, diagram here, but it is about joining all of the, the different pieces up. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, the people involved in the coalition at the moment keeps on referring to an onion and about how there's so many different layers to this. The important thing for me in all of this is that uh, we're not working in the same model, uh, in the same establishment model that uh, we've worked in before. Um, in this era of um, fragmentation and how we do things, there is a, a way that we need to be able to collect up the, the disparate thoughts and join them all up together. And this is this whole new approach to collaboration where we're all working towards this common goal. Uh, the unique thing here is it's all under contract for a common good, which I'm not aware of many other situations that haven't been government-led where organizations have come together to deliver something for the common good for, for everyone here. So it, the consultation is really, really key, and I'm not just saying this. I've been involved in many consultations myself um, over the years. The idea that we're having a consultation here is core to our philosophy. If you don't comment on this, we have failed. Okay? We need your input. We need the input of members. That's why it's so important that you're here. Um, we need to be able to improve this and make sure that we can all stand behind it when we get to July. Wouldn't that be impressive if we're all standing up on a platform and saying, this is the approach that we need to use? So we really do, I really do mean we want this consultation to work. Um, Steph is going to run us through a little bit more of the detail exactly about how you can get involved here. So I'll hand over to you, um, Steph, again here. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Mark. So um, the consultation it itself, there are four elements to it. So Mark's already covered uh, part four, the expert review panel, and, and also talked through, uh, mentioned some of the workshops and roundtables that are happening. But just to reiterate, members of uh, the coalition who are holding their own workshops for their members can um, download a, a pack that will include uh, feedback templates to be filled out. And the reason that that is important is it's helping us streamline the information that we're getting back into one standardize a uh, group of information. And really the backbone of that is uh, collaborees and um, feedback from the pilot testing. So I'm not going to go through the feedback from pilot testing here, but I am going to talk about collaborees. Um, I'll show you some screenshots of the tool in just a moment, but effectively it is a public website that uh, you need to get access to, you need to log into which um, you should be able to do if you're uh, a member of the MCC. Um, but if there are any issues, the emails to go to our consultation at naturalcapitalcoalition.org um, and, um, and give, us, uh, give us some information or, or details about that. But anyone can become, uh, anyone can go and comment online once they've got a user ID and password. And those comments are shown quite transparently. So if, 
you imagine what Facebook looks like and Facebook comments, we're effectively talking about the same thing, just a document instead of nice family photos to comment on. And you can thumbs up or thumbs down the comments as well. So it, it's quite a nice way of gathering some data. When you put your comment up, you'll be asked to tag it in some way. So the tagging of the comment is, um, I'll come to that in just a sec. Sorry. There you go. go back. No, 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 keep going. There we go. Tagging of the comment. So I'll, I'll go through this in just a moment. But as you can see, when you add in a new comment, you'll be asked to enter a title for it, propose a solution if you have one. Don't just tell us it's wrong without any feedback. We'd much rather get some options for, for discussing. Um, and then you can tag your comment as technical. Um, so something to do with content, structure, something to do with how the sections fit together or whether the actions are in the wrong order, uh, style, so that's much more to do with edits and the overall layout, any comments on the diagram, and finally, overarching comments on the protocol and sector guides itself. So if we go back up a little bit, there we go. So I should have started with this slide first, but... Um, Basically, as you come into the Collaborate system, you hit a page of instructions that takes you to the protocol and the different sector guides. Um, and it's really important that you look at those PDF documents because the whole document is not available in this system. So I'll show you how it's laid out in just a second. The other red circle on this slide, it shows the feedback button. That button is what you use if it all goes a bit wrong, if you have some sort of problem with entering your comments, if there's some sort of technical issue, that is the button to press because that is what the technical team will use to diagnose any sort of problem. Um, it is worth noting that um, later versions of browser recommended. If you have an old browser, there may be issues with performance, so do make sure that you have some of the latest browsers. Okay. So, as I said, the whole document isn't shown on the site, but what is shown is a little picture of a particular page and uh, a, a sort of title that says, comment on pages two to five here and what sections that actually includes of the protocol. And as you can see, there's a little comments, uh, comments icon at the top that you would press to add your new, new comment. Alongside that, you can see that there's a survey button. So in addition to asking you to put up these uh, comments, what we've also done is put some different surveys um, into the different sections of the protocol. They follow the stages of the protocol, and then there's one each for the sector guides, and an overarching feedback one at the top, which is shown here. So I'm going to stop there now and ask, um, really, for us to, to just take any questions on that process. So just, um, Steph, just to clarify on that as well. So the survey questions are there to help to filter comments and give people a a sense of uh, template and direction, but they're not mandatory, are they? They're not, you don't have to fill in the surveys, although obviously it does help us to start seeing trends and direction if you do do that. Um, so just to be clear on that. And, and um, to access the documents, the PDFs, um, just to reiterate that again, you go into the, into the process, you can download the documents, you can print them off or do whatever you want with them, go home, read them on the sofa, and then come back in and feed it back through this process. And that will help us to aggregate the many comments that we've already started receiving and make sure that we can um, work upon those and build upon that. We won't be replying to comments that are put up on the system. Everyone will be a reviewer in this stage of the process. But we will, when we close this in February, we will then start um, uh, dissecting that and we'll put together a report that will talk about the trends that have come through and you'll see that coming through in the final document that will be launched version 1 in July 2016. So are there any other questions or comments? I'm hoping that all of you already have access to Collaborees. Um, if anyone's already gone in there and has any thoughts or anyone, anything you want to add, then now's your chance to, to speak up. Um, Mary, um, Rosemary here. Hi, Rosemary. Uh, 
Hi. This is a comment to my colleagues at Conservation International. I know they are calling from around the world. Some of them are logging into this webinar from very distant places. Uh, note that um, as a large organization, we'll have um, probably quite a few of us uh, providing input to the consultation process, but this process will be coordinated by myself and Ishina who will be assisting me, and so you, unlike, it's unlikely that you will directly log in, but rather you're going to provide your inputs to, to myself, um, and I will coordinate this and input into the website. This is, uh, I believe it's the process for other large organizations with multiple um, inputs as well, but if you could speak about that, that'd be great. Cool. Um, and yes, Rosemary, that is um, relevant to all of the um, different members, we're asking them to try and coordinate through the key contact, um, and, and for Conservation International, that is obviously you. Uh, and um, if you're in any doubt at all and you want to get involved, then, then contact us and we'll put you back in touch with the relevant person, but I'm sure you all know those, those people. So I'm just looking at um, a question that's come through uh, in relation to the focus on impact and dependencies. Um, and whether that um, means that the protocol doesn't aim to measure and assess sustainability of impacts on natural capital per se. I think really what I would answer to that question is that the protocol is covering so many different kinds of applications and different elements of, um, different elements of the value chain and organizational boundaries that can be set, that it's true, it might not explicitly look at the sustainability of particular impacts in every instance, but in instances such as scenario analysis, actually that could factor in quite deeply. So I think I would answer that by saying it, it's really dependent on the assessment that you would look to undertake and the protocols providing the framework within which you do that. Thank you, Steph. There was someone else that um, uh, I think uh, was going to jump in with a question there as well. Yeah, that, that's me. So Catherine Eschel from Srez. Hi. Hi. Um, I was what relationship. How are you supposed to use as a piloter? How are you supposed to use collaborates versus the feedback form? Hmm. So um, as a member and a piloting company, that does become, there are two different ways of doing it. So um, you'll be hopefully you'll be uh, hopefully uh, assured that the questions that we've put into the collaborate system um, align with those that are in the piloting process. So as you are a piloting company, you're already feeding back through um, Gemma. Um, use that process, and we will collect it that way. Um, if there are other things, Gemma is then feeding that back into us when we will be amalgamating that into the collaborate system. So go go through Gemma as a piloting company to do that. Steph's just going to add in here. Yeah, so uh, the different surveys within the collaborative system are based on the piloting uh, questions, the questions that pilots are filling out. So you wouldn't need to do those. If you wanted to read through the protocol uh, in addition to the work you're doing on the pilot and provide additional comments, overarching comments, uh, editorial comments, that kind of thing, then you could also provide through collaborates. So I think in that case, the, the goal would be to focus on the pilot response, but the option's there for you if you want it on the system as well. Yeah, so, so work through Gemma uh, as you have been. Um, if there's other things that you do want to raise, then, then by all means go into collaborates, but um, we'll be doing that amalgamation um, from the piloting company. Does all that help right, to answer? thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. Any other comments or thoughts from people? I know we've got a lot of people on the line today, so don't be shy. I know it's uh, five to five on a, in the UK at least. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oops, that was someone just jumping in there? Yeah, me. It's Catherine Eschel again. Um, I was wondering, so now since I have you on the line, um, uh -huh. could you explain the choice to just keep projects as being so this mishmash of projects and sites? Because I know that for us, 
you know, we're, we do water and waste, which is very site-specific, and it's a very, very specific kind of impact and dependency situation that we'll have there, versus in our consulting business, that's more project-focused. And so to have them sort of confounded together, is, um, it means that it's a little bit harder to think through it, especially if you have more indirect impacts and dependencies, which is my situation, where it's actually very hard to go through this protocol thinking about indirect impacts when there are many opportunities and we are engaging with natural capital. Um, so I don't know if you can talk about that a little bit, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I, th I think the thing is here is that we, uh, it comes back down to the protocol being relevant to all organizations in every geography and every sector. Um, and that means that what we end up doing is we have ended up slicing up the pie in such a way that anyone should be able to pick this up and it should be relevant to them. Obviously, um, that what you're talking about there in certain circumstances for landowners and for others, there's going to be different approaches to this, which is why the applications and the scoping stage is so important to be able to map that out and work out what your needs are. It's, it's almost like, I don't know whether you, you, um, you read the, or if you have children, those books that you have where you, it says, you know, here's your options, turn to page 10 or turn to page 56. It's almost getting into that, that sort of scale of things, and it is an iterative process, isn't it? Yeah, I'm laughing that because awesome. that's a quote from a Dungeons & Dragons book, so um, okay. we'll just skip Sorry. over that. <laughs> but, um, but I guess that is an interesting question, and I, I think as well, though, to get that reflected back in the piloting experience would actually yeah. be quite useful. Because, in fact, as, as Mark has uh, iterated, Rosemary, Rosemary has uh, reiterated, we're in a draft phase, so this is trying to make it relevant for everybody and categorizing things in certain ways. If you don't feel that categorization works, then you've got to tell us. If a load of other people don't think it works either, then we've got to think about how we address that. So I, at the moment, I would say it's, we're still yeah. uh, up for looking at that kind of feedback and seeing how it fits across. Um, the rest of the comments that we receive. Hmm. But it's, it's a very good point, so thank you for that. Um, well, it'll be transmitted back to Jenna. <laughs> thank you kindly. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us on the call today. Um, I hope that you've got something from this. We will be running two more webinars, one in January and one in February. With those, they're going to be very different. Today was very much an introduction to where we've got to, making sure that everyone's got access to the document and running you through some of the top line. What we'll be doing at the next ones is taking some of those comments that are coming from Catherine and others um, that are coming through collaborators and through the piloting system, and we'll raise a couple of those topics to actually have as a discussion, a debate, so you can feed into those. Um, we'll be running one of those in January, and then we'll review that and, and come up with some different topics to talk about in February. So there'll be an opportunity to actually get into some more of the detail and have a bit more of a discussion uh, about those. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, I look forward to speaking to you all again soon. It's good to see so many uh, friendly names and faces on the attendees consult there. So um, we will speak to you soon. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark.